If you were to look around our community, I'm just an estimate, you may or may not know this. Uh, what, what percentage, if you were to walk around a, a public venue, mm -hmm. and maybe someone who didn't know, right? Um, and look around, how many percentage of people would be on some sort of drug or hooked on something? Probably a lot. I mean... I mean, is it more prevalent than most of us think? Yeah, that's, that's, de that's definitely true. Uh, you know, people that you don't even imagine doing the drug that you're doing, you know, like meth for me, like, I don't know where they, they'd be, you know, asking you, can you, can you help them out? Can you, you know? And it's just, sometimes it's a shocker because, you know, it's someone's mom, someone's dad, or, you know, you know, someone my mom's age, you know? Hmm. Definitely. What's the youngest person that you've ever seen high on meth in this area? Probably like 15. Wow. Yeah. So kids in school. Oh yeah, I mean, I was getting high in high school. You've been on the bench here in Ketchikan for how long? It's just a little over 16 years, wow. September 1, 2000. So, you know, you can't talk about a specific case, uh, obviously, but paint for me a picture of the, say the, the typical person or, or maybe a change in the typical person that you've seen come in front of you in terms of drug cases or substance abuse. Well, there's, abuse. Been a, there's been a major change, I think, in the types of drugs that we see. Mm -hmm. You know, 10, 15 years ago, cocaine was, was, if not the prevalent drug, it was among the prevalent drugs. Uh, that sort of morphed into methamphetamine, and now, unfortunately, well, methamphetamine is bad enough, but now, unfortunately, heroin is becoming, or has become, the drug of choice, and I think that's just simply supply and demand. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. just so, so less expensive. You know, we had uh, problems with Oxy. They reformulated it. We don't see Oxy cases that much anymore. Um, now, is the profile of the defendant any different? I mean, it seems to me, uh, and again, maybe it's because society is so connected nowadays, but it seems to me that the profile of a, a, a typical defendant uh, that's appearing in front of you for that particular reason seems to be younger. My experience has been that 15, 20 years ago, there, were, there was a small sort of core group of folks in town that did heroin, and they were older. Uh, rarely, if ever, saw it among young, younger people, high school age or 20s. Mm -hmm. And now, um, we frequently see it among kids, young people those ages. You mentioned um, earlier, kind of in our conversation before getting on camera, you mentioned um, just some of the numbers that we got from the state. Do you think you could possibly go over some of those numbers? And yeah, yeah. That we're seeing on a state d level? D well, there's some very concerning things. So just on a national level, um, we have 90 people dying every day right now of opioid overdoses. So that's significant on a national level. On a state level, most of the data I work with is youth-related. We use what's called the Youth Risk Behavioral Survey, which is developed by the CDC and then um, the state, and um, specifically high schools, um, will administer this test to the students. So it's a, like a survey, and it relies on students being honest and self-reporting. And what we got from this is 6.8% of students right now are um, actively using uh, prescription medications without their doctor's permission. Um, so that's, that's a pretty high number, almost 7%. And we also have 1.8% of students across uh, state, statewide that are um, using heroin, almost 2%. You know, you take that 2%, 7% put together, it's almost 10%. So almost one out of 10 kids right now are abusing op opiates in some, way, some form or another, um, which I think is really significant. Um, another thing to consider too about this is it's not just them that they're going to affect. It's not just one person that uses opioids because it's an expensive habit, because they're going to need more money, they're going to have to draw more people in. So for every student um, that's abusing these medications or taking heroin, they're going to pull several more people into their life and they're going to get them to abuse and use medications as well in order to help support their habit. And that's one of the reasons this opioid crisis is a crisis, is because it's something that looks like it's going to keep on growing exponentially. And uh, that's why we're here to try to answer that. What are we going to do about it? Ketchikan clearly is experiencing some issues with drugs. What are you seeing? My experience tells me um, I was here approximately 25 years ago as a young trooper. 
When I was here before, um, of course, marijuana has always been popular in Alaska. Um, cocaine seemed to be one of the things that we would see as the harder drug. And of course, um, we don't think of it as a drug, but the other substance of, that gets abused was uh, alcohol, and alcohol seemed to be the prevalent thing that I, uh, we ended up dealing with on a regular basis. What is interesting to me is the influx of both methamphetamine and uh, which people like to call crystal meth, but also heroin or opiate type uh, abuse. And it's significant here. Reed, talk to us a little bit about what we've been seeing in this community and the effects of, of drugs and, and kind of what, what you've seen personally. Well, um, I took a, a hiatus from this community. I was gone for five years down south and I recently got back here about a year ago. And when I first got back into town, um, a lot of people were talking about finding needles around town. And I didn't really know what they were, were talking about at the time. Um, but the third night I was here, I was actually approached by a young woman about 9.30 um, out on the main street here. And she asked me if I wanted to buy some heroin. And uh, it was kind of shocking for me. And uh, I said no, of course. And she was asking if I knew a place she could shoot up. She was looking for like an alley or something like that to shoot up with. And um, you know, after I said I wasn't interested in heroin, she kind of wandered off and, and did her thing. And so, and that's when I started noticing that people were talking about needles, and actually I started seeing them laying around town. And um, so that's, that's my experience. It's coming back to Ketchikan after being gone so long, knowing a lot of acquaintances, a lot of people that I, I cared about in the community, and coming back and seeing them, um, you know, abusing drugs. I mean, that's really what was happening. A lot of people um, are having some real difficulty. And so that's what I've seen here in Ketchikan, personally, um, a rise in, in uh, intravenous, you know, needle usage, um, and a lot of good people getting caught up in abusing drugs. Talk to me about the first time that you ever used drugs. Um, I was 16, and I was with an older crowd of people. So you must have been in high school still? And why were you hanging out with older folks? Um, I just I had a friend and her parents, I guess. I just was around the mm -hmm. older people all the time. What was going through your mind when you were using drugs? Having fun and making money and all that. Not, nothing about the future, that's for sure. I wasn't thinking about anything that could happen or that happened. Tell me, tell me about how you, how you grew up. What, what was your family like? What was your, what was your home like? Uh, my home was good. Uh, I grew up with a brother and a sister. I played a lot of sports here. Um, normal childhood, about 13, uh, I started getting in trouble though and started going in and out of CRIF, which is the youth center. Tell me about that first time that you came in contact with drugs. Uh, my first drug ever. Uh, I was 13 and uh, it was a bottle. Um, my friend's house, uh, he, it was 99 bananas, vodka, and his older brother. Just one night partying, you know, and that was my first time drinking. Did it seem like a big deal at the time? Yeah, it was scary. Yeah, I, kn I didn't know what to expect. Tell me about that first experience. What was going through your head? What was that like? Um, I was happy <laughs> and I don't know. I just had a lot of energy and I, I don't know. It was like a euphoria, I guess. And I just didn't want it to end because, you know, coming down isn't the best feeling. So I would just do more and more until either I ran out of drugs or I couldn't stay awake any longer. So after that, was it drinking for a while and then what happened? Um, it was drinking for a while, smoking weed, until about 17 when I tried meth. Yeah. Talk, yeah. To, talk to me about that. Where did you come in contact with that? I mean, what, what maybe tipped you over the edge to say, I will try meth? Um, my sister, well, I have a family member who was pretty into it, and uh, I just, you know, I was drinking and getting in trouble, and 
Um, my, my sister was into it pretty heavy at the time. And uh, I don't know, I wanted to hang out with her. And she was doing it all the time. And I just wanted to see what it was all about. So I tried it with her. And it was, I was done after that. It was, it was all over. When, what, why? What was it like when you tried it? It was... Uh, that first time, I mean. It was... <laughs> It was it was awesome, like I don't want to like glorify it, but like that's how it made me feel, you know. Like anything, I could do anything. Did you feel like after that first time? I mean, you said you mentioned that was it. Mm -hmm. it. It was over. Was it that? Was it just all that and that? You like I cannot stop. Yeah. Well, I mean, I stopped drinking and smoking weed and doing all those, and like that was my the only thing I did after that. I stopped everything else. Every, you talked everything else. You stopped everything else. What other things in your life did you stop? Uh, I stopped going to. I stopped going to school. I stopped going to work. Uh, I stopped seeing my family. I stopped hanging out with my friends. How much were you spending a day? Uh, I spent a lot of money on meth. Uh, I got an inheritance once, back in a couple years ago, for. $100,000, and I went through that in less than a year. Wow. Yeah. Holy smokes. Yeah. You had all of this stuff going for you in high school. Mm-hmm. How many months was it until it disappeared? A year, maybe less. Yeah. So you really were kind of isolated even before you got locked into a jail cell. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, you started stealing from people they don't want you around. You start lying to people they don't want you around. And the only people that want you around are people that want to get high or want you to get them high. And when Insab's not around, they're not around. And it's all you. When did you realize that you had a problem? Mm. When it would, was it just like this lightning bolt? When I was 18, I think. And when I realized I, I needed drugs to function, I guess, to get out of bed and do normal things. And I didn't really have friends anymore. I just kind of stuck to myself. Another thing to consider about drug usage is when people get more and more heavily involved with drugs, they isolate themselves. Um, they get a close group of friends. That group of friends just gets tighter and tighter and tighter until everybody is using drugs together in that group. And they isolate themselves. Um, so isolation not only because we live on this little island in the middle of nowhere, but isolation also because of self-imposed isolation. You know, they're not getting out in the community, they're just hanging at home every day, um, looking for their next fix, particularly if they're an intravenous user. You know, it's something they got to have every day. A lot of these people are a polysubstance abuser, so if they can't get heroin, um, they'll get meth. If they can't get meth, they'll go get some Suboxone on the street corner to hold them over until they can get some more heroin. What's an average day look like for a meth user? Like, uh, like in, a, in a bad habit? Mm -hmm. uh, anything you can get a hold of to get meth? I mean, uh, here, this town's a little different, you know, on, on the drug scene, but um, you just get high and that's all you, you look for is the next thing, you know, the next fix. and. I mean, it's either you're selling your stuff, you're selling somebody else's stuff, or you're trying to make money to get it. And it, was it like every hour, every four hours, every eight hours? Like every hour, or every, you know, as, if, as much as you had, you know. You know, you get high and that's all you think about is getting the next high and getting your next high. And... How many people in a percentage of your cases are those that are preying on the misery of others versus users? My my impression is that most of the cases we get with people charged with or convicted of, you know, possessing with the intent to deliver or delivering are lower, on the lower rung of the distribution um, Maybe just scale. feeding their own habit. Yeah, mostly it's to feed their own habit and, and then they sell some on the side. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we do have people that, you know, are, are in a different category. Yeah, and, clearly. You know, the, and statutes and, and this, uh, our criminal statutes treat those people differently, and that includes the sentencing components. Let's talk about the people that you dealt with when you graduated from user to dealer. Mm -hmm. Did you ever walk away with any sort of, did you have it in your mind 
that you just didn't care who you sold to? Did you think about what was happening in those people's lives, or do you think about that now? Uh, I didn't think about it, uh, you know, really. I saw how much money was coming in, and, and you know, and it kept my habit going, you know, and that's like the main thing that I was just worried about, is just, you know, keep going. I didn't think about people's lives until I got locked up, and, you know, I saw the people that I was dealing with out there come in, and then, you know, the way they talk about their family and what's ruined now, mm -hmm. you know, that's, the, that's how I look at it. So why meth and not heroin? Um, well, like I said earlier, my sister was on it, and uh, she, did, she did both, and with heroin, I could see the, the withdrawals of it, you know, how bad it, you'd be hurting and how bad you'd get sick, and I, you know, I'd see her crying and, you know, screaming, and just, just the pain that she was in from coming off of it. And, you know, with the meth, all I would feel was just tired. You know, I'd get all sick or whatever, you know, withdraw and sleep it off. So heroin scared me just be for the fact that you could die off it. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the highest, what do you think the drug problem is in Ketchikan? Either 9 or 10. Yeah, it's getting bad. How serious is the problem in Alaska and Ketchikan compared to the rest of, Ketchikan. say, the lower 48? I have friends uh, that, uh, that are more acquaintances and through work colleagues that are DEA agents that have worked in South America that think that this place is highest per capita consumption of drugs than other places they've been. So if you've worked in South America where they're making it and it's all over the place, uh, I would surmise, not trying to put words into them, but this is pretty serious. You mentioned that some of the people that you dealt to ended up mm -hmm. incarcerated as well and oh, in yeah. trouble. Do you remember any terrible stories maybe that they shared with you? I've, I've heard stories of, you know, when I've been hanging out with someone and uh, they just, you know, they might, people I hang out with use heroin and stuff too, but overdosing, yeah, that was a big thing that I uh, started noticing a lot more. <laughs> Has it become more prevalent? Yeah. yeah why? My, why? Uh, I don't, uh, why? Um, people just don't, I don't know if it's, they don't realize what, how much they're doing or they just don't care anymore, but yeah, it's getting bad. Are you yeah. ever scared of overdosing? Um, I've never really thought it would happen or think it could happen to me when I, you know, when I was using drugs. So, I mean, after, you know, now that I'm in jail, I thought about it could have happened, you know, but while I was using it, it didn't occur to me. Would I be surprised if I were going around town, if you were walking beside me and you could say that person, that person, that person, that person is using, would I be, would I be shocked? Yeah, I think so. Some is it people, just that many people? Yeah, there's quite a few people that you wouldn't think use, do use. And, you know, and there's also, I mean, there's obvious people that have bad reputations that, you know, everybody looks at them and they already know they use. But there's also those people that try to stay out of that, you know, bad reputation. And they just try to isolate and use for themselves, I guess. You're out and about. You're not in those handcuffs right now. You're out and about doing your same old thing, mm -hmm. right? And this is the second time you've been caught. Yeah. You're out and about doing your thing. Give me a, give me a little look into the people that are gonna come your way looking for drugs. Are they, are they from good families? Are they, you know, business owners? I mean, Oh yeah. Show I mean, me, show me the gamut of who the, who these people are, with obviously without the, naming them. The spectrum is broad. I mean, uh, you got people like I worked at the shipyard. You know, you got people you work with. You got uh, people with no jobs. You got people who, you know, it, with families, with kids, with uh, you know, living at home, not living at home. You know, uh, it doesn't. There's no end to it. I mean, business owners. Fishermen, loggers, uh, people that you know work at grocery stores. Uh, you know, it doesn't. It's all over. So it was a little bit of everyone. Oh yeah. Not the typical 
you know, low income or the stereotype. Oh no, yeah, it's uh, ever it's uh, any any and everybody. So I think there's a lot of different things in life. It could be overeating or smoking or whatever it may be, where people think, oh, it can only happen to other people. This won't happen to me. Mm -hmm. Did that go through your head? Yeah. Um, you know, I thought I was stronger than my family member, my sister, you know, I saw her struggling and how it was hurting the family. So I thought, you know, I wouldn't let that happen. I, I'll be able to, you know, stop. And uh, it doesn't, you know, like your confidence starts to lower because you keep doing it. And, you know, the, you don't think you're addicted, but when you start doing it every single day, all the time, you know, it's, it's hard to just pump the brakes on it. And, you know, you beat yourself up so bad that you just do that cycle, you know. Um, yeah, I thought I was a strong little person, you know, especially in high school, doing sports, you know, uh, working, just, you know, living a normal life. So, you know, I thought it would just be one of those things that you could pick up and put down, but. What is that typical situation where a person who may know nothing about drugs might finally find themselves in the thick of it and, and, mm -hmm. and having that angel devil on their shoulder? Um, here is a lot different than down south. I mean, here it's just that it might be that one friend, you know, that has dab or has an older sibling that's dabbling or, you know, and they get into it and that's your friend, you know, because I had a friend whose brother was into it too. And, you know, once he he tried it and I tried it, it was kind of off to the races, you know. Um, you know, high school is all about parties, you know. So you, you have that one friend who has it on him or he knows where to get it and, you know, just ask you, hey, you want to get high or do you want to try this? And, it's, you know, if the, it's pretty much that the friends, mm -hmm. that one friend, you you know. So if I were a parent and I were wondering where my daughter was going to be next, or mm -hmm. I might want to look at her friends. Yeah, you know, my mom always warned me about the, the company I keep, especially, you know, f for certain ones. And, you know, it was good reason because of those ones that are into it now too, you know. Uh, it's definitely, definitely the people around, you know, family, or, you know, your daughter, or anybody, you know. Um, and my mom always used to tell me, you know, Nothing happens good after 2 a.m., you know? So I always thought that was the stupidest thing ever, but, you know, it's true. If you're out and, you know, it's 2 a.m. and you're not home yet, nothing good's going on out there. If you were in your parents' shoes, mm -hmm. how would you approach this with your child? And what would you have noticed and how would you have approached it? Uh, I think about that sometimes, you know, like um, head on. You know, it, beating around the bush doesn't do anything. I, you know, if, if it was my kid, I'd be straightforward and, you know, draw the line, you know, because I, my mom just kicked me out, had enough of it, you know, after I stole all her stuff. And uh, yeah, once, once it goes that far, you know, and you, you draw the line and it continues, you gotta be, you know, I can't, no enabling, no helping, you know, until they're ready for it. Because, mm -hmm. you know, once you get your foot back in the door, you know, then you, you feel like you won, you know. So, like, that was my thing. Like, you know, I'd try to sober up and get my foot back in the door and then go right back downhill. But, uh, yeah, with me, if it was my kid, I'd just have to draw that line because there's no... With someone doing meth, you know, they turn shady is the word I'd use, you know, very scandalous. And... Uh, you gotta be upfront or you'll lose every time. Let's pretend you know that old scenario of the devil on one shoulder, <laughs> the angel on another, because we're going to assume and hope that you are never at a party, right? Mm -hmm. Where these things are present. But you've got a young person, any person for that matter, who's getting ready to try that for the first time. What are you gonna what are you gonna be whispering in their ear? Which one am I? Am I the devil or am oh, I the angel? You're the angel. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would just tell them to think about, you know, their friends and their family because that's the first thing to go. 
your real friends, the people you grew up with, uh, they don't stick around to watch you go through that. And you know, if those friendships and the bonds are real, then you'll definitely want to keep those because with mine, people I grew up with aren't around right now. And that's the saddest thing because, you know, social media, you see all your friends and everything they've done, you know, college degrees, families now, you know, off living life, doing everything. And I'm stuck here doing this. And, you know, so that's the one thing I'd be whispering, you know, if you want a real future with your friends and your family, don't do it. A lot of these people that are, are policy makers, um, police officers and stuff, they just, they're not going to get it. They don't understand addiction. They're not someone who would ever get addicted to themselves. So it's a big stretch for them to um, understand what these people are going through. Yeah. Well, and I, like, something that's been up, brought up a lot, too, is, like, the ACE, like, the ACE score, whatever yeah, that, ACE that is. Yeah, ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences. Yeah. And uh, I think that's important. Um, they talked a lot about doing trauma-informed um, practices. So instead of trying to make people out to be perpetrators, instead of trying to make people out to be victims, you come together and you try to heal together. Um, and it's a different type of philosophy than we've ever really tried in the United States before. And I don't know if we're ready for it, but evidence seems to suggest that that's the way, um, the most effective way to move forward. But it, you know, it's, it's, it's hard because we're very punitive when it comes to our, our legal system. It's all about punishment. It's not a lot about reform, and uh, I don't know if we're, we're ready there. When we did pass the SB 91, and that kind of was an indication that we're ready to decriminalize this stuff. Um, but at the same time, you need to have these really strong administrative courts. You need to have other things in place to motivate people um, to make positive decisions in their life. Because if you just take away um, them being criminals, um, that's not really a solution to them changing their behavior. It just means you're not going to throw them in jail for it anymore. So, SB 91, relatively new. Right. July 12th, it went into effect. What does that do? Tell me, tell me how that changes the, the well, landscape it, it, here. It, it, it does a number of things. In general, what it does is uh, recognizes, I think, that jail is not the be-all and end-all, and that there are, are uh, offenses, and there are people convicted of offenses for whom or for which jails really not appropriate or long-term jail is not appropriate and we end up compounding problems when we have longer-term jail sentences. I think part of it was driven by the uh, budget reality we have in the state. True. If, the, if the trend continued as is with the prison populations, uh, they'd have to build a new prison I think by 2018. Oh wow. And we just can't afford as a state to do that. And you know, we, like I said, we, uh, moment, a moment ago we have this pretty significant recidivism problem and uh, we are increasingly incarcerating nonviolent offenders, which I think a lot of them are probably drug offenders. And um, people are spending more time in jail pre-trial, so they haven't been convicted of anything. Mm -hmm. And so I think that was part of, part of the thought process. It's also part of sort of a nationwide trend of uh, justice reinvestment. Would it, ideally, this is gonna result in savings to the state as far as the corrections budget and a part of that has to be plowed back in on the other side for the types of things we talked about earlier, substance abuse treatment and those kinds of things, mm -hmm. so that we can address the, the, the problem, the criminogenic problem, substance abuse, um, outside of a jail setting, but that's gonna take money, it, not as much as it costs to incarcerate somebody at an average of $159 a day. And it's significantly less expensive, for example, to have somebody on electronic monitoring um, and to have scram units and other things where you can remotely monitor or that they're using or those types of things. A, a fraction of what it would cost to have the person in jail. Now, of course, there are people that should be in jail that are, are dangerous to the communities, and we're not talking about those folks. We're talking about people that can be safely released into the community, lower risk folks, um, particularly with these other safeguards in place. Elena Habib from the state contacted me oh, about a month ago and said that the state wanted to come up here and do some planning about how we're going to deal with the opioid crisis here. And they came here to get everybody in the community, um, professionals, um, non-professionals, community members, tribal member members, everybody that had a stake in what's been happening in our community. 
and they wanted them to come together and, and talk so they can gather information. Um, the state didn't want to come and say, you know, here's the plan, this is what we want communities to do. Um, instead, they wanted to take an approach where we're going to find out um, what the community's already doing, um, what's working, what's unique about these communities. So when we put together a plan, the plan's not just going to be our idea, it's going to be an idea of all the Alaskans working together. And so that's what this conference is really about, was just grabbing this information from the community, getting this feedback so they can then take it to several other communities and then eventually come up with a comprehensive plan on what they're going to do. With SB 91 and SB 54, that's the kind of discussions that are, be, you know, are slowly happening on how can we do different kinds of correctional reform. So it's valuable to have uh, champions, right, advocates from within the within the system to say, look, we do need these diversionary processes, ways to connect. Yeah, we had a, a lot of small group dialogue which I thought was very effective. And what that consisted of is gathering people in groups of like 10, 10 to 15 people and having um, like a moderator moderate the group. And, um, and then just for people to just sit around and brainstorm and think about what's happening in the community, what they'd like to see happen, um, the strengths, you know, the weaknesses, opportunities for change, those types of things. So you mentioned um, strengths, weaknesses, um, and uh, opportunities for change. What are what are some examples of those? At least what what yeah, things you took yeah. away from that? Yeah, a, a real strength I think we took away from this conference was our medical providers here in this community. They've been doing a lot to decrease uh, opioid prescriptions. Um, all both KIC and Peace Health have uh, prescription tapering policies. So if someone's prescribed one of these opioids, they're going to know that there's going to be an endpoint. They're not going to take this medication forever. Um, they also have them sign pain contracts um, so people are aware of that these medications are being, uh, that can be very addictive. Um, so they're doing a, a good part in doing that. So I say they think that's a significant strength that they're cutting down that overprescription, which also reduces diversion. And, and diversion is just when someone takes their medication and instead of taking it themselves, they sell it or give it to somebody else, which is really common when people are giving a lot of a prescription, which is kind of what would happen in the past. Mm -hmm. Someone would get maybe, you know, a hundred of these pain pills at once and um, they would divert them, they would sell them and they'd end up on the streets. And so I think that a real strength is that they have clamped down on that and that's not what's happening anymore. They've done that very effectively. Um, as far as weaknesses, probably our comprehensive treatment here in Ketchikan is lacking. We don't have detox. So if someone is experiencing addiction to alcohol or opioids, they need to get their head clear before they can seek treatment. And we don't have a facility where they can go do that. Um, one of the things we talk about in this community is maybe doing medicalized detox. So doing that at home, that's a possibility. Um, we do have treatment, we have Car House here, and that's an effective program, but it's also limited in how many people they can take. They only have 15 beds and oftentimes. Um, people need to get into treatment. When you have someone who's addicted to a substance and they've realized that they want to change, they want to do something different, it's something you have to act on right away. I don't know if you've ever seen these intervention shows where it's like, it's all about getting someone to say they want this intervention. As soon as you say yes, they grab them, they put them on a taxi, they take them to the airport, fly them straight to the treatment center. That's what's effective. Um, but here in this community, it could be a two, three week wait. Um, by that time, the person's changed their mind. They, they decide to go back to using. And so that's a, that's a weakness in our community. We need to be able to jump on that and, and uh, do something for them when they're ready to change. So Ruth, talk a little bit about um, what you do here at, at Gateway and, and I guess Gateway just in general and the services that are available. Okay. Um, Gateway Center for Human Services is the community mental health center in Ketchikan. Um, we do a number of different things. Um, we, we, we own the car house or we run the car house, which is a 15 bed co-ed long-term residential treatment center. Um, we have a couple different levels of outpatient substance abuse treatment that we run here also. For those that are out there kind of struggling with their addiction and don't mm -hmm. know what to do, um, where, where can they start? In town, uh, there's two places. They can start here uh, or they can start at at KIC. 
to go to treatment anywhere, most places you need to have a, a, a substance abuse assessment done ahead of time. We can do that, um, even if somebody wants to go elsewhere for treatment. Um, we do a lot of referring out. Um, I, I, I'm, I know that KIC does also, but as far as locally, those are the two um, providers. Uh, I would also say there's, there's a, I mean, get to a 12-step meeting. Uh, part of a substance abuse assessment uh, will identify what level of treatment somebody, the, what level of treatment the counselor thinks the person needs. Um, so to get into the car house, you need to have an assessment that says you need that level of treatment. Um, and then most of the time we have a waiting list. Um, there, there are way more people needing treatment than there are treatment beds available, and that's an understatement. <laughs> it's a ridiculous understatement. Um, uh, so people will apply, they'll, from around the state, they'll apply to come into the car house. We get those applications, they're, they're staffed, and, and then if somebody is accepted, they're given a bed, a bed date that we think that there will be a bed available. Um, once they're in treatment, it's a three to six month process. Um, I think that the folks that have been through it are, are probably um, more valuable to ask as far as what it's what it's like than I will say it's wonderful it's a great program I love being down at the car house uh, and that is actually the truth I love being down at the car house it's really fun we had somebody come in a few months back that uh, that a number of us had had contact with through different uh, avenues here uh, emergency psych or or uh, we do some stuff up at the jail and anyway went into the car house and then I was down there for a staff meeting uh, I don't know several weeks later and uh, this person walked past and I said now wait a minute who's that and they said oh that's so and so and I <laughs> was like no it's not it just it, it I love being down at the car house because you see people's lives transformed it's it's very cool what inspired you guys to start your recovery? You know, what was what was that point that you were like, I need this is the time. This is I need to get sober. For me, it was uh, I got arrested for dealing drugs in 2014, and my third time, um, I've been at 16 years, and uh, I just it's like crap, man. And I went to jail. I was in jail. And I was just sick and tired of the life. And Judge Stevens, I gave him a treatment. I said, no, so give me the option. And he says, you can do that. And instead of going to prison for forever, you know, 16 years, <laughs> you do well there and graduate and get out and stay going good, well, you know, go from there. And uh, I went to treatment and I was, I went there as an angry man. Um, wasn't my fault. It was everyone else's fault. I was very um, just angry. And uh, after two months, I realized that um, I belonged there and that I deserved it. I deserved a better life. It was just life changing. And uh, today, I just, I'm so grateful for. The life I have today, and it's because of uh, what I learned at the car house and uh, Aquila. And now that I work up here, it's even better to have um, even more support from them all the time. Um, I've got some good friends, you know. Like Karen's dad, my, my two of my better friends in town, you know, we hang out lots. And it's weird that we're together last night, and I'm like, dude, there's three of us here that are still clean and sober. How rare that is. You know, 10% of our group is going to be clean from when we graduated, and it's like each of us. So, you know, there's hope, and I'm glad I got the opportunity. When I got arrested the last time, I broke into a pharmacy. I was, uh, um, standing outside as a, when I was walking away and I had a lot of a lot of drugs in my backpack. Two cops came walking around the corner and seen me. 
They had no idea what was going on. But they stopped me and asked me what I was doing. It was 12.30 at night. And uh, I said nothing, you know. What are you guys doing? <laughs> and, then the, <laughs> and then one of the cops asked why I had these pink rubber gloves on because I had these dishwashing gloves that were all the way up and it was 12 o'clock at night, so... <laughs> I looked down and I was like, damn. Like, and then I looked at that building and I, my daughter flashed through my head right there. And I've been in jail 24 times before this. And that's when I thought right there, what are you doing? So I just explained to the cop what I did, how I did it, told him I pulled his crate off of a, a um, wall in the back of the building crawled in, cut a hole in the wall, climbed in, found the drugs, and walked out. And they, they, they were both standing there, stunned, like, turn around, they had the backpack on. <clears throat> That's when I thought, you know what, I'm done. 20 years of doing drugs, and then, like, in that minute, I thought of my daughter, because I was like, this is gonna be 10 years of prison. I'm tired. <clears throat> That's what helped me give a little nudge the right way. What actually got me on this whole road of, to recovery was I had a heart attack. And I ended up in a hospital down south in a 14 hour surgery. You know, and, and I wake up and two or three weeks out of my life were gone. And I'm in this strange place, and nobody I know, nothing I know, you know, and I realized for the first time in God knows how long, I'm going to have to do this without any of the chemical crutches that I've been, you know, indulging in for so long. And um, so that was a huge, that was a huge wake-up call. And up until then, I had been quite literally living two whole separate lives. You know, one was, I'm the man about town, I'm the chef, I do all these TV shows, I do, you know, all these charity auctions and fundraisers and public events. And privately, I'm addicted to meth and I'm dealing it so I can continue feeding this habit. And when the heart attack happened, everything came crashing down. You know, the whole separate lives that I had built for myself suddenly was laid open for everyone to see. And it was ugly. It was, it was not pretty. I ended up going to the halfway house in Juneau for a year before I got word that I had been accepted as a client at Car House. And um, I, really, I really count my recovery as starting with my treatment at Car House. I've been clean and sober for just about four years now. But I've only been out of Car House for about a year and a half. And the real recovery, the real work of recovery started when I was in there. Um, and thank God it did. If you're an addict or alcoholic or you're a loved one of an addict or alcoholic, you just keep trying. Um, there is never a point in time where or a life just is too far gone, they're not worth trying uh, to, 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 help, to help them get into recovery. Um, that there are people who are in recovery all over the place, and, and it's just too bad that most people who interact with them on a daily basis don't realize, oh, that's your local heroin dealer, oh, that's your local meth dealer, they're just clean and sober now. Um, but, but there are people in recovery all over the place. And I know it's discouraging and people get discouraged about it. I know that there's, um, uh, you know, it seems like any time I read the newspaper or I'm, I'm listening to the radio or anything, you're hearing more and more and more and more and more about the opiate epidemic and, and you know, the effects of substance use in the community. And it's, it's real. It's here. And we just keep trying. When I first went to the car house, uh, I had no family. Um, my daughter was taken away from the state. She's in state's custody. 
Um, she was away from me for like 10 months um, when I first went to treatment. I, <clears throat> I was really, I had pushed myself so far away from my family that I didn't have any. And um, so when I went to the car house, um, I came to have those people be my family, like these people sitting at this table. Um, and so when I first, sorry, um, when I first went to treatment, it was for OCS. It was for um, felony drug charges. You know, it was for other things other than myself. Um, but having the six months of sobriety in the car house and then making it through probation, I had like two years and I had, uh, um, and I got my daughter back in that time too um, and created a family. I had learned what it was like to live sober and um, the day I got off probation, um, I relapsed because I was, that was my, that was what I was doing it for. That was my string holding me accountable, you know? And um, I started drinking and then within a month, I was using heroin again. And it was, uh, it was really hard to, to come out of that. Um, my denial of what was going on my, it was really thick, like, I didn't, I felt like I could hide it from the people around me, <clears throat> but it was very apparent, and, um, what got me help was the support system that I had created around me, um, my best friend Deb, um, people that see me every day, people that know me from the car house, um, you know, my new family that I made. And um, what got me out of my relapse, I think, was just accepting the help that's around. Like, there's so many people that want to help you, you know? I mean, when you've been um, wrapped up in addiction and you come out of it, like, I, you just want to help people, you know? And um, so I actually asked to go back into the car house again because, um, because that place really worked for me. And I uh, appreciate, you know, appreciated everybody there. So, um, so I got to go back in for like a month and, um, and got back on track. So um, that's how I got out of my relapse. I put myself in a pregnant women's treatment center in Anchorage, my second treatment center. And um, I ended up staying clean and sober for almost six years. Um, my daughter was in kindergarten. She grew up in the rooms of AA. And, um, you know, it was really hard when I ended up relapsing and walking away from that recovery life. And then my daughter like had no idea who I was, you know, for so for the next three years I brought these people around her that she wasn't used to being around and um, put myself in situations. And um, so it was hard like coming back in into recovery and going into the car house for my third treatment center, but um, it was the disappointment in her eyes. She was seven at the time and uh, she just looked at me with like disgust and just disappointment, like she was done. And so it was like right there, that pain of like, <clears throat> she's really hurt. Like I really, you know, I'm hurting her. Uh, was that willingness came back to want to do whatever it took um, to set things right again. And then um, that next bout was another four years. And um, you know, you can try something as easy as something at the health food store and it can wake up that addict in you. And then the next thing you know, like, you know, marijuana is legal in Alaska. And, um, you know, I'm already kind of keeping a little secret about how much of this, you know, CBD oil I'm taking. So might as well just smoke marijuana. And I thought, like, you know, I did pretty good. I ended up getting my associate's arts degree. I managed a restaurant. Uh, they wanted me back. Things aren't that bad. Um, but the, the, the third time around was uh, my daughter purposely knowing that I had an edible on my nightstand and took it and ate it at school and called me really sick 
Um, and I knew right away, like, because I woke up and I couldn't find it. And I was like, didn't really want to ask her, you know, and I wanted to tell her. I was thinking, I'm going to let you know, like, that's a really, really strong cookie. Like, you know, so if you took it, but I didn't because I was scared. And so until she called me from the hospital, or not from the hospital, from school, and it scared the hell out of me, and I picked her up. And, um, and then it was like, either she can go on blaming me, just like I can go on blaming my mom, um, and then nothing changes, or I can stop it right now and uh, get back into surrounding myself with people in recovery. And, and then I had to like come to that realization that, you know, to some certain point, I'm doing this for her. You know, and doing it for her isn't working for me. Like I have to want it wholeheartedly myself. Um, and the reason, you know, was like, you know what, Michelle, it's it's time to start taking care of yourself and loving yourself no matter what goes on around you. Um, so that was the next time that I had come back in. When you're in your addiction, you're really self-centered, and everything revolves around you. And so, um, doing anything that keeps your ego, you know, because your ego can come up in lots of different ways, like whether you're, well for me, like trying to control situations I can't control, um, not listening, um, like all those where I think that my needs are more important than other people's needs. So anything, like even like doing like 10 minutes of meditation in the morning or helping other people or anything that keeps me small and the big picture big. Mm -hmm. Really? Mm -hmm. Like that. Yeah, I like yeah. the way you said that. Mm -hmm. Keeping you small and the big picture there. Mm -hmm. I bumped in a guy. Um, can I say his name? Yeah, Mike, Mike Pearson over at uh, Vigor. And um, because uh, I'm a community oriented guy, I, I, um, I found him. He was at uh, Wish Women in Safe Houses. He was on the board at one time. And I really liked the perspective he had as a community. In a nutshell, their employees all have brilliance in them and they're looking for it. Well, what's really interesting about that even further is that a number of their employees are guys that have come out the other side or are just getting off uh, some kind of drug addiction. And those people have brilliance in them and these people are fostering it and they're using uh, a method to, hey, if in your life you could figure out when things were the best, and you could get back to that, what would that look like? When were they the best? What did that look like? How do you make that happen here? How do we help you make that happen here? Vigor is a second chance employer with a last chance program, which means a second chance employer means that they don't care really what your past is, I mean with some exceptions, um, but they really don't care that you have a criminal record. They don't care who you were, they care who you are now. So that's the second chance part. The last chance program that Vigor has is that should you be injured and or should you take a random and have a uh, test positive for an illegal substance, you can go on a last chance program, which means that you'll be monitored, you'll take UAs, well, you'll be off work until you can pass a UA again, and then you'll be monitored uh, for up to a year, mm -hmm. I think that it is, um, but you'll be allowed to keep your job. The, the fact that we are a second chance employer, first of all, um, not only did it allow me to have a job here, but it has allowed a lot of people to have a job here, including um, in my individual department, um, that with that kind of upfront information, when someone's actually making stri or taking steps towards bettering themselves and, and being transparent about the things that they've walked through, um, it allows us to coach that person, it allows us to interact with that person, uh, it allows that person uh, at times to feel comfortable to ask for accountability, and when things do go south, when, some, when someone does stumble, um, all of that stuff up front having been done already allows them to be comfortable enough in some cases um, to ask for help, and, and, then, and then Vigor is able to provide a lot of resources through our EAP program and um, through different kinds of recovery support as well as what we're doing in the yard. So we have a meeting here once a week called ORS and it's ORS stands for Our Addiction Recovery Support. Um, it's pretty much open to anyone that has 
pretty much any any issues, whether it's drug and alcohol related or even behavioral related, all are welcome here. And it's it's an hour that just gives people a chance to connect and talk with each other. And that really is key. We come up here once a week. Uh, we sit in the circle and we talk to each other. And it can be, we've had as little as few, uh, as few as three people here at a time and as many as I'd say probably 12 or 15. And, you know, the, the program in and of itself, not only is it the taking of a space, and in this space, quite honestly, there's been so many things shared in this space that this space, to me, has become to feel sacred. Mm -hmm. um, even just being in this, this space here, um, talking to you, maybe I'd be a little bit more nervous. This space was selected for today because of that. Um, for me, when I meet in this space with our group ORS, um, I know I'm getting several things. I know that I myself have set aside time to focus on doing the right thing and, and making the next right decision. Um, that my brothers and sisters in arms are joining me in that and something unique is happening in this dynamic when we share our experiences and make ourselves vulnerable and transparent and someone else that could damage us with that information uh, is doing the same thing in return and so for me what has happened is it has built trust mm -hmm. with these guys and the other folks that show up for that regardless of who they are and how I know them prior um, when they show up in this meeting and they hear me and they see me and I see that they come back and they didn't betray that and then they do the same and I reciprocate the same way for them, something resilient happens and there's a bond that's unspoken, it's unbreakable and it's ever present. And so when I see these guys outside of this circle without ever even having to speak to that, it's just known that we can trust each other. And so that, I don't know how you measure the impact of that, except that even speaking it, um, I have an emotional response. And so it's powerful. And that's what it is for me. Um, so, I, you know, I'll speak for myself. And to piggyback off of Chris, it's, it's interesting because you'll have everybody from supervisors just to deck plate workers. And in this circle, everybody's the same. Everybody connects, everybody bonds, and it doesn't matter your title, it doesn't matter what you do in the yard from sweeping up floors to, to work and repair, new build, doesn't matter in this yard. In the circle, everybody's the same, and we create that bond. One of, one of the things that, so people that are willing to, to move into personal growth, um, and this does not, as, as Frank was pointing out, this does not set up upon the managers and supervisors. This is something that's available to the deck plate workers and everyone that works here. Um, so when a person goes into the leadership program, they get to look at th they look at things like uh, how to witness themselves, how to pay attention to the crazy roommate, mm -hmm. how to quiet him down um, through different practices such as mindfulness and breathing exercises. You know, you can call it meditation. Um, we take a non-religious approach as to embrace everyone's values and belief systems. Um, it really has to do with science. And so there's a science behind, and Mike champions this, Greg Howe champions this, our, our doc master and, and our general manager. Um, and they, they learn how to, they learn about an ego wall um, and how to get on the side of freedom versus the side of fear, you know. And in recovery, we, uh, you'll, you'll hear the phrase that anger always covers fear. Um, it, it, lots of other things cover fear as well um, and that's the wrong side of the ego wall and so through practice of witnessing and all kinds of other really unique games and things that we do um, and, and some really hard work mm -hmm. that we do um, identifying uh, characteristics and things that are standing in each other's way for each other and with each other um, it allows people to start to look at that and figure out how to be work with each other like you could take two people that are complete opposites and put them together and make them bond and make them talk and make them, you know, try to figure out which side of the eagle wall they're living or they're working on. You know, are they working on the fear, the anger side, or are they on the freedom and the love side? And which side do you want to lead from? That is so unusual to hear that language in an industrial setting like this shipyard. Especially a shipyard. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we are we are even unique for a shipyard. There's stuff that we do here that they don't do in any shipyard. Why are you so passionate about this program? Because it works. 
it works, and it's it's changed me. Mm -hmm. So I've been here about nine months, and when I got here nine months ago, I couldn't have done this. I could barely I could barely talk in a group. I mean, I am a supervisor, but I have a very difficult time speaking to groups and large numbers of people more than say five or six, and that. Um, since being here, doing the programs, uh, doing the sitting slash meditating, um, and just the culture here, connecting with people with similar background as I have, that's began to melt away. Um, it's began to melt away. That's that's uh, the best I could describe it. Is that that my life is is better, is better now than it was. And that goes into recovery. I mean, if you can, if your life is better and you can trust people. You know, I have problems all the time, but, you know, I'll go to Chris or Ron or Russ or many, many people in the yard, and it's just nice to have that wall of support. You know what, it's, I think it's about that this shipyard nurtures uh, our ability to connect with each other, to be able to honestly connect, and the shipyard supports that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. They, yeah, they make room for it. In fact, they encourage it. From the top, bo from the top down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I went to jail, I planned a lot of different things. I mean, the criminal mind is a really crazy, yeah. you know, it, it, it's a really, really lost place. And when I was in treatment, they said that they were going to accept me in the car house again, and I was grateful for that. But my mind kept telling me, when you get into the car house, you can climb out your window, go back down, and take the drugs that they took from you after you stole it. <laughs> they won't even know it was you, because you're in the car house. That's how bad my mind was, you know, it was, it was really deep and crazy for her. And then when they, when they put me into the car house, I mean, when, they, when they, I got to go up to the car house, I walked from doorway to doorway and I'd open each side because I was like, I was looking at 10 years and now I could walk out the door anytime I want to right now. <clears throat> I've seen all the opportunities that I could take. I could walk outside, I could walk around in the parking lot, and I could, there's a trail that left, that leads right up to an apartment complex where I used to get drugs up here also. And I was like, I could go at any time I want to, and nobody will even know. But I had, to, myself, I had to tell the counselors what I was thinking. I had to tell on myself to make sure that I wasn't going to do something to repeat what I was doing because I was terrified mm -hmm. to go back to jail again and I was terrified that I was going to hurt everybody else in my family and terrified that I was going to hurt myself because I was, when I first got into the car house I exercised every morning and I exercised every day after class because I was terrified of myself that I'm going to just run or I'm gonna cause more problems again that I'm just gonna s screw everybody else's life up like I've already done so far. So everything that I had to do, I had to be honest. I had to tell them what I was thinking and I had to tell them. And then I would go around, we'd go around town in our van and I'd say, oh yeah, I used there. Oh yeah, I used to get drugs there. Oh yeah. So getting sober in the same town that you know where you could go, it's really hard, but it can be done. You just gotta be honest. I had to be honest with myself and say, I'm freaking terrified of what I'm going to do or what I can do again. And just go from there and put action into words that you, I mean, put the words into action that you said you were going to do. Some say, like, some say, some say I won't get over it, but it scared me now. In your heart, you think you can get over it? I hope so. I want to believe I can, but I know it's going to be really, really hard. What makes you, what, you know, what motivates you to, to get over this? Habit? My family. You know, uh, through this, this isn't the first time I've been in trouble for it. I've uh, been arrested for drugs before this and a couple years before this. And uh, only people that have stood by me, you know, uh, it's just sad to see how much I heard, you know, this drug has done to him, especially my mom, because we, you know, steal from her, you know, money, all her stuff, go to jail and expect her to, you know, be there still, ruin relationships for her. So, just my family. 
All right. Well, I, I, my comments with regard to Mr. Carlson are going to follow the same general outline as those with respect to Ms. Cannon. Um, you know, the underlying offenses in these cases were, were, in both cases, were serious. He has not fared well on probation. Um, and until the most recent set of circumstances, it was limited to his own, his own demise, basically his own use and and the, the consequences to himself. Now we have the new case, which you know involves significant, um, relatively significant drug dealing, and you know while on felony probation, um, he does get the benefit of the, the reduction in charge, of course, and the mitigator, but the overall set of circumstances were very serious as well. Uh, if the state had had a different view of you and your potential and uh, decided to proceed with the cases as charged, if convicted of even one of the new charges, you'd be looking at years and years and years in jail. As I mentioned to Ms. Cannon, I, I, I cannot lose sight of the fact that it's not just the consequences for you, it's not just the consequences for your family. And I, 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 I recall what you wrote last time around and, you know, how bad you felt for your friends and your family because of what, what you had done then. And, you know, so much more so now, I suppose. Um, and same for Ms. Cannon. But, you know, it's the consequences for the people that you're providing the drug to and the impact on their lives. The unfortunate reality for both of you is, you and Ms. Cannon, is your brains are damaged at this point. I mean, physically damaged. If you took a snapshot of your brain now and you'd see the deficits. And the good news is that um, with abstinence, the brain, brain's very resilient and will pretty much recover. But uh, once an addict, always an addict. You, you know, they've done studies I've actually seen, you know, the the films and such it, it, as part of my training, uh, what the, the kinds of things that you're going to have to deal with. You know, you run into somebody that you used to do drugs with, um, your brain's going to light up. The cravings are going to start. You drive by the house where you used to do drugs, the same thing's going to happen. So I guess there's something to be said for a fresh start someplace else where those types of things aren't present and where people aren't going to know you or your background. and. You know, you both have, good, have felony convictions of record. It's going to be difficult to get jobs that could impact housing. Um, but there's something to be said for, for a fresh start. So you don't know when you'll get out. Mm. What, what would it be like, and, and I have no idea about sentencing guidelines or anything else. Mm -hmm. But just to put a hypothetical out there for someone that may be watching this. Yeah. You're 23 years old. What if someone said, we won't see you until you're 45? <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be rough. That'd be, you know. I mean, I've pictured that, you know, if I keep doing it. Uh, after a few times, you know, people get tired of the same thing. You know, uh, drug dealers in town, especially in small towns, uh, bring a lot of uproar, you know. It's a small community based around friends and family. So, I mean, I, I'm judged on that now. And, I mean, it's, people don't, they want to see change. And that means, you know, drug dealers going away for a while. Uh, the, 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 the 12 months imposed on the new case, eight, eight months with good time. The 11 additional months imposed in the old case, uh, roughly seven point something months with good time. It's consecutive, back to back. Uh, I, I'll, I'll do, I'm going to do the same thing for you I'm going to do for Ms. Cannon. I'll recommend that they place you in a facility where you can either access the RSAT program or a halfway house. My hope, and frankly for both of you, my expectation, this is what I expect from the two of you, is that you will be part of a new video in a few years, uh, if not here, elsewhere, where you can say, look where I was and look where I am now. And that would be a video shown to people that are sitting where you're sitting right now, so that they know that you know, people have been where I'm at now and they can make it out and they can be successful. I, 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 I think if I sat down and went through some old files and, and jogged my memory, 
Um, I, I've been doing this as a public defender, as a prosecutor, and as a, well, as a judge now for going on 16 years. Uh, I could come up with a list of between 50 and 100 people pretty easy that sat right where you're sitting right now that are no longer with us because of drugs, alcohol, the lifestyle. And that's the last thing I want to see for either of you. Okay. So what do you think when you do get out? Mm -hmm. What do you think it's going to take to, to restore people's faith in you, in our community and within your family? What do you think it's going to take on your behalf? Action. Yeah, I'm, I'm used to just using words a lot, you know, oh, I'm going to change or I'm not getting, you know, I'm staying away from drugs or people, but actions for sure, you know, showing that I'm actually working, um, spending quality time with family, you know, working on my future instead of getting right back in the same old mix. What could the community do <clears throat> that would be similar to what the shipyard has been doing to help this problem, which is clearly a problem, and not just in catching him? Drop counting. Drop counting production, drop counting money, drop counting your objective, and start counting your people and their, their value and figuring out how you can help them to see it mm -hmm. and help them to understand who they are and how much brilliance they have. Yeah. Focus on developing people more. Yeah, that's what our general manager says. He says, we don't build ships and repair ships, we build people. When, uh... I was out there using, I did nearly anything and everything to get what I wanted. Lied, cheated, and sold. Day and night, I chased everything and I worked hard to get what I wanted. Like, really hard. Like, you, I mean, I'm pretty sure all of us did. We worked day and night to make sure that we were high or didn't get sick again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I when I started getting sober, I was like, what am I going to do for myself to make sure that I'm going to be okay? I never know if I'll be okay for the rest of my life, but what am I going to do now to make sure that I'm still moving forward in my life? My daughter's life, my girlfriend's life, and our, our children's life. What are we going to do to make sure that I'm going to do okay? You know, I mean, I... <clears throat> we started our own business, I mean, it, and it's hard to make a life for yourself after you've known nothing but drugs for 20 years and then to move into society and try to be with society it's really it's it's a struggle because people still look at you and still talk down on you so it's hard to make sure that the feelings stay like not to blow up not to have a reaction to the same stuff it's a daily struggle to remember hey you're an addict just breathe, don't take things personal. I mean, I'm reminding my, myself that all the time. Do not take things personal because they don't understand the stuff that you've been through already. They don't know the stuff that you pushed forward to do already to make your life better, to make your family's life better. So that's what I love. I mean, I make sure that, and uh, <clears throat> I mean, I struggle daily with, with the anxiety, fear of not being able to make it to, to, to make the bills, to make, I mean, I sometimes go for rides because we're not, I'm not struggling, struggling, we're making it by. But what's that saying? I wouldn't change my worst day or my best day of being high for my worst day of being sober now. Yeah. <clears throat> really, because I mean, I am still here and I can still feel and I can still think for myself. So that's huge for me. And even if I am struggling now, it's still a hell of a lot better than where I used to be. Well, I'm not in recovery. I've never experienced an addiction issue myself, so I think it's best that they talk about their own issues. But just generally, um, it takes a long time to get better. Um, this is a serious addiction for a lot of people, and it's going to take multiple times for them to get clean and sober. Um, I think everybody I've heard talk about this is they've been to treatment several times, they've been to prison multiple times, they've been to jail multiple times. Um, so it's, it's a long process. And I think a lot of people are wondering if they're going to go through with that. They're, gonna, they're wondering if they're going to get treatment 
and they're wondering if the community is going to accept them back into it. And that's why it's so important for these people to, to in the community that have experienced this to come and tell their stories, to say, I was there, I was, I robbed this place, and I realized, you know, it was just too much finally, and I turned myself in, and I got treatment, I got help, and look at me now, I'm back here in the community, I'm being successful. Because that gives um, people that are wondering that, they have that question in their head, if I do seek treatment, am I ever going to be able to come back? Am I ever going to be able to be accepted back by my family and my community? It gives them an answer, you know, and the answer is yes, you know, there is hope there. So I think that's, that's important. So sure. the only thing I have to say that has any value whatsoever is when it comes to addiction, keep trying. Keep reaching out to people. Call AA. Call, call um, anyone you know who's in recovery and ask for help. Uh, call here. Call KIC. Call. Keep trying. And, and there are people in recovery all, all over our community. You just don't necessarily know it. But treatment works. People do recover from from substance use addiction. If you need help, get it. It's out there. It's worth it. It's a lot of work, but it's worth it. Yeah, and just don't play the unique card because there's a lot of different people in recovery, whether it's treatment or wherever. You know, you can get help from churches and not ever have to step into a 12-step recovery meeting and things like that. Right. Just if you surround yourself around people who are good for you and, um, you know, whatever. Just don't try to be unique, like, oh, that's not for me, that's for, not for me. Like, if you really want it, um, you'll make that change happen. And there's a lot of people who have been through the same thing that you've been through and are willing to help. I get comments from people from time to time in the community, and then I see things in the paper. And, uh, you know, I, when it's your own kid, when it's your own husband, when it's your own wife, when it's your own mother that's there in the defense chair with the problem, people really tend to have a whole different view of this situation than when it's somebody else's problem and they're reading about it in the newspaper. I remember in Car House once, you know, we were talking about this and somebody said, well, how do you know you're not ever going to use again? You know, can you say that you're never going to use any drugs after this? And I said, no, but what I can say is to, by the time I go to bed tonight, I will not use today. And that's, it sounds so trite, so cliche, one day at a time, but that's really all, all we can promise ourselves. That's all we can do is one day, I won't use today. Tomorrow I'll worry about when I get out of bed tomorrow. I can only do today. And that's worked for four years. I'm Alex Brown here with Michelle O'Brien. And we've spent the last two years working on a project trying to find community members here in Ketchikan to share their stories about their dealings with addiction, recovery, and of course, that whole process. Well, exactly, and it's a disaster of epidemic proportions here in Alaska, with the rates of overdose tripling in the last 10 years. In fact, last year in 2017, Governor Walker declared this an official disaster for the state, and that's why it affects our community. It's so raw in our community because we are so small. Yep, we see our neighbors, we see our friends, we see our family members who are really being affected by this crisis. You know, in fact, it's such an important issue, especially here locally. That's why a couple of years ago, the state of Alaska court system contacted KPU in hopes that we could share this story and really make a difference in the community. And I think we're also hoping that this is shown not only here in Ketchikan, just also through the entire state of Alaska and the schools, and that somebody can take away something from this and hopefully save at least one person's life. So Michelle, talk to me about your experiences working with these people and interviewing them to hear their stories. So I think for the, for the most part, a lot of people around Ketchikan and anywhere else for that matter, they're walking down the street and they're completely oblivious to the fact that the person walking next to them or passing them actually might have a problem. So to kind of get up close and personal with these folks and hear their story, in many ways for me, it was very devastating. Uh, on the other hand, it also filled me with a lot of hope because what I, what I truly saw was the human side of this in the sense that here's folks that have 
this huge problem, no doubt about it, right? It's a problem that has affected our town, our society, their families, their friends, and well beyond that. But in their heart of hearts, they want to fix that problem and to become productive members of society. I noticed, especially with interviewing those people in recovery, was that that hope is there. And they, all of them said the same thing. Even their worst moment today is 100,000 times better than what it was as an addict. And finding those people, and those people willing to come through and share their stories and rejoin the community, I think is a beautiful thing. I couldn't believe how much bravery that these people had to talk about this. And I think they were all happy to do so because they want to try to do what they can to prevent others from going through the things that they went through. Absolutely. It's a, for me, I think my, my impression was this is a very deeply personal thing and it has greatly affected their lives. And for them to share their stories with us and quite frankly, the entire community is pretty amazing.